to see you all here this morning. It's always good when we gather together as a community to pray. This is the first day of the week, and it's the early part of the day. And what a splendid way for us to begin uh, our new week that is upon us by gathering together in order that we may pray. Prayer is perhaps the highest and noblest uh, endeavor in the human heart. And I have yet to meet a person that has never prayed. Even the most hardened atheists will have to admit there are moments in their life in which they call out to the God they refuse to believe in. As they say, there are no foxhole atheists. And I think this is very true. Because our belief in God is something that is intrinsic to our humanity. And even though the human intellect may deny the reality of God for reasons uh, that seem to be pleasing to their own intellect, we give ourselves away when we're in trouble and we cry out to someone who is out there who might have the ability to save us from our trouble. Wouldn't you agree that this is really the state of things and this experience that we call life, in particular human life? So belief in God is something that is intrinsic to our humanity. I am religious because it is a human thing to do. We're the only creatures that we observe uh, in all of life's manifest forms that engages in this kind of behavior that we call religion. And there's never been a civilization or a society that has been without religion. It wasn't like it was one person's idea. It is a universal human experience. And so religion is something that we as human beings create in order to express something very deep within the human psyche within the human heart and soul. So it is good that we begin together this week with prayer. And throughout the liturgy, that is the Mass, we are engaged in continual prayer. We hear and listen to the readings of inspired writings from the Bible. That is a prayer because prayer involves listening. We bring to God our petitions and our concerns during the prayers of the faithful because it is something that moves us, that is, our deep need to ask God for his blessings and for some sort of alleviation from the suffering and the troubles that we experience in life. And then we offer the highest prayer of the church, which is the prayer of the Eucharist which means thanksgiving. You know, th giving thanks is the highest form of prayer. And we do so as we offer our gifts of bread and wine, which as Catholics, we recognize as a miraculous moment in which ordinary bread and wine is transformed for us in an unseen way into the body and blood, soul and divinity of this person that we call Jesus, whom we claim to follow. And so from beginning to end, in every song that is sung, in every word that we recite, we are in the act of communal prayer. And this prayer that we do together didn't begin with the opening song of the liturgy today. It actually began when your alarm clock went off this morning. And, uh, and you drug yourself out of bed because you had formed an intention within your heart, I shall go to church today. That was a prayer. The action of setting the alarm and closing it down and getting yourself out of bed, you're already praying because the best prayers usually are without words. And so your actions and your gestures become sanctified. What is ordinary Monday news and Saturday, then on Sunday morning becomes a holy prayer in the activity and the action that you're performing as you picked out what you were going to wear today to impress your other parishioners, or maybe not to impress them. 
or whatever you were doing, getting in the car and making your way here, it was all an act of prayer because it was an act and an expression of that deeply felt desire within the human heart that we call faith. And faith is a funny thing because faith is not something that I can generate on my own. No rational arguments and no endeavor of mine will ever result in bearing forth faith in my life. I cannot create faith. And yet, faith is a part of who I am. It is a part of who you are. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift of God's grace to you. It is only God that can impart the gift of faith in your heart and life. And so our prayer rather ought to be like that of the father of the epileptic boy in one of the gospel stories where he says, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Pray that you may receive more and more ever-increasing faith within your heart and within your life. We often speak of life as being a journey. And I find this to be a very effective analogy because it really seems that way, doesn't it? And the older I get, the more it feels like it's been a long journey. And now that I'm on the eve of becoming 60 years old, I realize that most of the journey is behind me now and that time is growing short. And what makes things even more anxious for me is that the older I get, the faster time seems to go by. It's like we're suffering from <clears throat> time inflation. <laughs> and uh, I can't believe where the last 10 years have gone. And I remember in the early stages of my life, 10 years was forever. And now it seems to go by in the blink of an eye. And so uh, I, I am now looking at the sand glass of my life. And you know when you put up a sand, sand glass, an hourglass, you see the granules of the grain, uh, grains of sand are coming through uh, the uh, hourglass, and it seems like there's so much at the top portion of the glass, right? And it seems to be that way unchanged for a long time. And then you become engaged in your life, and you look up again, and there's just a little bit of metal left, and then you can see it's running out very quickly. That's how I feel at this stage of my life. It is a strange journey, and we don't even know where we're going. In fact, I would uh, suggest to you that uh, most of the things that happened in your life was quite unexpected. The twists and the turns, how things turned out, the ups and the downs, the disappointments, the troubles, pain, and also the joys and sorrows, because that's the way we all experience uh, this thing that we call life. In the Bible, there is the story of the ancient Israelites. It's the story of the Exodus. It is the defining story of the Jewish people of the nation of Israel. They celebrate it every year at Passover. And this story uh, is, it unfolds in the narrative that is provided for us in the Torah, which is part of our Christian Old Testament. Uh, we, it's more than just an interesting story. It becomes an analogy of human life. We are all on the journey of the Exodus. The people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And then God chose his servant Moses and through mighty divine works then was able to deliver this enslaved, oppressed people out of their uh, slavery in Egypt. They passed through the waters of the Red Sea, and they were going to the promised land, whatever that was. They, no one had ever been there before. But as they got through, passed through the waters of the Red Sea, they found themselves in the wilderness. One of the most inhospitable deserts in all of the world. And it's called the wilderness of sin. Isn't that interesting? That word is not related to our moral word that we use to refer to infractions of the law. We call it sin. 
But there they were in this place of desolation, in this place that was hostile to all life. It was barren. It was a place of great scarcity. And they became afraid. And what do human beings do when they're afraid? They complain. That's what they did. The people of Israel, after seeing all the miraculous uh, works of God that delivered them from slavery, once they got out to the desert, they became afraid and they began to complain. They began to murmur among themselves. I like the word murmur or grumble. It's like under the breath, you know. It's not like they're shouting out to God. They're talking behind God's back, thinking that God doesn't hear them. <laughs> and they were saying things like, we would be better off as slaves in Egypt when we had plenty to eat. And here we're brought out to this desert place, and God is probably just going to let us die here in the wilderness. They complained to Moses and Aaron. And probably the most challenging uh, thing for Moses in his ministry was not confronting the worldly power of Pharaoh. It was having to face the complaints of the people he was tasked with leading into the promised land. And so Moses goes to God. And God says, not to worry. Let the people know that I am with them. They will see my glory. And sure enough, there in the wilderness, God became visibly present or manifest to them in the great cloud of his holy presence. The glory of his presence appeared to them as a great cloud in the day and a pillar of fire in, at night. And this is called by the Jewish uh, sages the Shekinah glory, the presence, the Holy Spirit. And what this suggests to us, my brothers and sisters, is that we too are wandering in the wilderness of our lives. Some of us don't even know where we're going to get the next meal. And we worry about retirement, or if we're going to be able to fulfill that American dream and buy that house or get that job. And as we are in the wilderness of our lives, we are reminded by the wilderness experience of the people of Israel that the presence of God is with us. In fact, whether we are aware of it or not, God is always with you, hidden within your heart, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. And we are reminded as people of faith that we are not walking this journey of our lives alone, that there is one who guides us and leads us and sustains us because he's the source of all that is. He's even the source of your very life. And he is quietly working in a hidden way within the depths of your heart as you walk through the wilderness of your life. How do you like that analogy? Isn't this true? It rings true to me. And we're headed to the promised land and we don't even know what that is. So we are people in transition. And the transition is but for a time. Just a momentary time. And we endure much hardship and suffering, but through it all, God is preparing us for our actual destiny, which is beyond the next horizon. And that is where we're going, to the promised land. But in the meantime, God is taking care of our needs. God is feeding us food as he fed the people of Israel. You know about the quail that came on the east wind every evening uh, that brought them to the people, and so they had plenty of meat to eat. You've got to have protein in your diet. And then every morning, a frost would come over the ground, and it would disappear and leave behind flakes that was baked, gathered by the people of Israel, and baked into bread. And we are told that when the people of Israel saw this on the ground, they said, what is this? And so it got its name, manna. Manna means, what is this? <laughs> and I'm reminded of Jack in the nightmare before Christmas, when he goes to Christmas land. Remember that? Jack was from Halloween land. He goes to Christmas land, and he's looking around at all the wondrous things about 
Christmas, and he's grabbing them and he's singing this great song written by the same guy, El Danny Elfman. Yes. It was part of Oingo Boingo. Yes. Yes. Okay. So anyway, he's singing. He's singing this song and recurring refrain to that song. What is this? What is this? What is this? Just like the children of Israel. What is this? We don't recognize it because when God is feeding us, oftentimes we don't recognize that the experiences of our lives are actually is actually the food that enriches our souls and gives us life. Jesus. Many years later, after this experience, being Jewish, this was part of his heritage as well as those who were listening to him, talks about the bread from heaven, the true bread from heaven. He identifies the true bread of heaven as being himself. He says to them, I am the bread of heaven. Jesus and his life, my brothers and sisters, is your food for the journey. That will sustain you. As you begin to commune with Christ and you feed upon him, he gives you what you need from his life. His life becomes joined with our life. We are never alone. And he is the one who sustains us in this thing that we call the spiritual life. St. Paul speaks about that in the second reading we heard today when he wrote to the church at Ephesus. And when he wrote to that community, he hardly had any idea that his mail and his letter would be read by Christians 2,000 years later in the 21st century. And here we are listening to the writings of Paul, and he was just writing a letter to a small community in Ephesus. But he says something here about the nature of the spiritual life. And we will gain wisdom and insight if we listen carefully to the apostle. He says, I declare and testify, that is, I give witness. You cannot give witness unless you have a first-hand experience. If I tell you about Jesus based upon what I read in books, I'm not giving witness. I'm just passing on something that someone else had passed on to me or me. But to give witness is what we are called to do. But I need to have a first-hand experience with Jesus in order to bear witness of him in my life. It's true for you as well. We are all able to have our own first-hand experience with Jesus, who is the bread of life, so that we can bear witness as did the Apostle Paul. I testify in the Lord that you must no longer live as the pagans do. How do the pagans live? They live in the futility of their minds, the boastful proud of human intellect. You see, the pagans were not stupid. They invented philosophy. The pagans who live in the futility of their minds, darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of their ignorance and because of their hardness of heart. If you try to pursue life through the way of intellectual understanding, you will always come up short. You can never read enough books because we will always, no matter how much information in this information age that we acquire for ourselves, we will always be living in great ignorance. Do not put your trust in human wisdom, the apostle writes elsewhere. And also, he talks about the real problem. The real problem, my brothers and sisters, is within the human heart. Hardness of heart. And Paul is saying to you and me today, do not live like the pagans, based upon your own understanding, because Paul took far short of reality, and with a hard heart. That is not how you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard of him. How many have heard of Jesus Christ? Okay. So assuming that you have heard of him and were taught in him as truth is to be found in Jesus. He is the embodiment of truth. Jesus didn't come to give us a new philosophy. He was not a philosopher. He came to give himself. And he understood himself and his life as being the bread for humanity. And then Paul goes on to say, 
And this is very key to the spiritual life as disciples of Jesus. You must set aside the old self with all of its corrupted ways through illusion and selfish desire. There is the old self. What is Paul talking about here? He's living in the first century. The old self, my brothers and sisters, is your ego. It is my ego. It is a construct based upon my experiences of life and motivated by my sense of survival. And the ego is that part of the old self which is really a false self. It is something I have created based upon my growing up in my environment, and so I identify myself with the false self. The problem with the ego is the ego is always narcissistic. That is, the ego is always looking out for self-interest, for number one. This is the problem with capitalism in our society. I'm not criticizing capitalism as a system, but it is based upon the false self. To get as much as I can in material possessions and in wealth and in power and in fame. That is the old self. And Paul is saying we must set aside the old self because it is false. It's not the truth. And we need to embrace the true self, which can only be found in the person of Jesus when we are in relationship with Jesus. And so he says, put on the new self, created in God's image, whose justice and holiness are born by means of the truth. And what is the truth? Or who is the truth? Jesus. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But the truth is a person. The word of God is not a text on a page. The word of God is a person. Nor in the Bible does the Bible state it's the word of God. We call it that. But we are misleading people. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible bears witness to Jesus, and it's the Bible that says Jesus is the word of God. The word of God is a person. And we will know the word of God when we are in relationship with that person, when we partake of him who is the bread of life. And how do I partake of Jesus? How do I partake of him? How do I know him? By coming to him and surrendering the false self and the ego to him so that you may see your real self, the true self, the new self. And that new self derives its life from Jesus, who is the bread of life. So when we gather here at Mass on Sunday morning, we're not just going through some Hindi ritual. We're hearing the teachings of Jesus. And as we listen to him, we are drawn to him. And then we culminate this experience every Sunday morning by coming to the Eucharistic table. And we are not receiving any longer ordinary bread or ordinary wine, but rather we are receiving the extraordinary uh, bread of life, who is Jesus. We're receiving his flesh, and we're receiving his love, which all signifies the life of the Son of God. And the more that I'm in union with his life, and the more that his life is in union with, with mine, then I am set free from the deceptions of the old self. Beware your ego. It's your greatest enemy. Your ego will lie to you. Your ego will teach you to be afraid of others. Your ego is at war with your true self. And so I found myself one day wrestling with the devil. And then I realized I was wrestling with myself. You are your own your worst enemy, oftentimes, when you're living out of the false self, out of the ego. That's why the false self and the ego must be crucified. As St. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. The I is the Greek word ego. Nevertheless, I live. But it's not I who live any longer. But it is Christ in me who loved me and gave his life for me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That is the mystery we enter into. That is the key to the spiritual life. So as you come to receive the sacrament of his body and blood and soul and divinity, realize at that moment 
that the life of Jesus is being renewed and being placed within you. And all you have to do is stay in union with Jesus and all else follows. You will have the truth. You will have love. You will have faith. You will have hope. And these things never disappoint. That is what he means when he says, I am the bread of life. Amen. 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 Let us stand together and confess our faith.